what's happening between you and me now that there's no one else. You know, during the Vietnam War, uh, one of the young ladies in my classes came in and she threw this little poem on my desk. And I want to share it with you. It's, she called it, Things You Didn't Do. And she says this, Remember the day I borrowed your brand new car and I dented it? I thought you'd kill me, but you didn't. And the time I dragged you to the beach and you said it would rain and it did. I thought you'd say, I told you so, but you didn't. And the time I flirted with all the guys to make you jealous, and you were, I thought you'd leave me, but you didn't. And do you remember the time I spilled blueberry pie all over your brand new car rug? I thought you'd smack me, but you didn't. And the time I forgot to tell you that the dance was formal, and you showed up in jeans? I thought you'd leave me forever, but you didn't. Yes, there were lots of things you didn't do, but you put up with me, and you loved me and protected me. And there were so many things I wanted to make up to you when you got back from Vietnam, but you didn't. Go ahead and put it off. Go ahead and wait for tomorrow. If there's something that needs to be done, you do it now, because tomorrow may never be there. And especially is that true in human relationships. Don't wait. The time for life is now, the time for love is now, the time to do is now, not tomorrow.
Before, oh, I can see all the eyeballs in the world, and my heart is warm. Before I start, I have to, I have to do a little something for, uh, and you'll, you'll understand just in a minute. But um, you know that I can't handle this, and I can't handle this. And uh, but I had to wear it tonight for a very, very special reason. When I was on my tour for Born for Love, uh, I went to, I was gone for seven weeks. And uh, those of you who know about my travel uh, situations is I travel very lightly. I had one tiny little suitcase, and you could actually carry it on. I was running from city to city, you know, half the time I didn't know where I was. And uh, I was on every possible show. Those of you who watch a lot of television were probably about up to here with Leo, you know. I was on Sally, and I was on Donahue, and I was on this one, and I was on that one. And it never occurred to me that there are people who actually look at what you're wearing. <laughs> Can you believe that? And so with this tiny little bag, I had two coats, I had three shirts, I had some underwear and some socks, and I had two ties, and I wore them for seven weeks. <laughs> and you, you, know, you wouldn't believe how many letters I got from people saying, Leo, is that all you own? <laughs> and there were even some people who said, you know, we can afford to buy you a new tire and a new coat. I, you know, I never thought of watching somebody and thinking of, uh, uh, what are they wearing? But uh, they, they do, and so for them, I bought an entirely new outfit. <laughs> I mean, I want you to see... <laughs> new shirt, new tie, New coat, new trousers, new pants, new underwear, the works. But now that they've seen it, here we go. You know? Hey, you know, I want you to notice something, too. You remember the first show I ever did was with uh, KVIE in Sacramento. And, uh, you know, who was Leo? Well, who's Leo now? But uh, who was Leo? And so when I took my coat and my tie off, there was no place to put it, and I had to drop it on the floor. Well, as the years progressed, the next time I did a show, uh, they gave me a place, a coat hanger. Now I have my own private person. <laughs> How about that? But you know, the best thing of all, I, those of you who know me well know that I have two great loves. One is little kids, and another is the elderly. And I just find those two segments of the population the most fascinating in the world. I mean, the little kids still haven't lost the magic. You know, they haven't been told that the world is a terrible place, et cetera, et cetera. So they believe it's wonderful, and for them it is wonderful. So whenever I have an opportunity to be with children or the elderly, I, I do. And recently I was asked to uh, help in a dedication of a home for the elderly. And the doctor who was organizing it said, uh, uh, oh, Leo, you have to go in and see the people who are bedridden because they all watch your shows and they know you well. And I said, no problem, I love it. So I walked through, you know, and here was this wonderful woman, and I hugged her and she hugged me, and we walked into another room, and then we walked to a room where there were several people in wheelchairs, and I sat down with them, we had a wonderful conversation. And finally I walked in the room, and there was a very alert little woman popped up in bed there, you know. She even had blue hair. <clears throat> and she looked so good. I mean, I just loved her. And I walked up to her and I said, um, uh, he told me everyone there knew me. You know, so I walked up and I said, um, uh, do you know who I am? And she looked at me for a long time. And she said, uh, no, honey, I don't know who you are. But if you don't know, <laughs> I'd suggest you ask the head nurse. She knows everything. <laughs> Don't you love it? Every day is a surprise.
Uh, Benjamin Disraeli actually did the title for my last book, Born for Love, and he said this, we are all born for love. It is the principle of our existence and its only meaning and its only end. And you know what, it's amazing how many of us give lip service to how much love means to us. We say we can't live without it, we, we're in search of it, etc., etc. But there are very few people who dedicate much time to the pursuing of love, to the, trying to understand what this dynamic, wondrous thing is that is our gift, and probably our greatest gift of life. And I can attest that dedicating your life to the process of finding out what love is all about is probably the most wonderful thing you could dedicate your life to. Love has taught me so many things over the years. It's, it's relieved me of conflict, literally. It's so funny how people have to be right. You know people who always have to be right? Well, you know what? I let them be. <laughs> oh, they're ranting and raving and screaming. I learned a wonderful, wonderful way to handle this. I smile at them and I say, you know, you may be right. And then I think, won't it be fun when they found out they were wrong? But you know, the result of ignoring love is that we end up spending millions of dollars a year on therapy and on attorneys to get over our pain and the pain which our separation causes our family and our children. So maybe it's time that we rearrange our priorities. But we continue to take love for granted. We abuse it. We accuse love for our failures. We define love for our own purposes. You know, recently I got a letter from a woman, I, I won't even quote it, but we've, we've got a correspondence going. But she said that uh, she hated all of her friends and family. She had no friends and she had no family. And she said, but it's perfectly all right, Dr. Biscaglia, because they were all selfish, no goods, unappreciative, and rotten to the soul. I said, everybody? The only one that she could say something nice about was her cat. And she said she was going to leave all of her inheritance to the cat. Well, you know what's, what's so interesting to me is that everyone is so easy to condemn. But we don't analyze our own loving behaviors. Surely there must have been some good person among all of those she hated. So we may be born for love. That is to say, we may have the potential to love but we'll never actualize it until we're dedicated to working at it. And until we do, we're going to have more loneliness, more despair, more confusion, more hate, more frustration. And this seems so logical. That's why every one of my books says, these are the things that are essential for love. And it's fine that people buy the books, but do something about it. The loss of love is probably the greatest loss you'll ever experience. And there's no making it up. And tragic, the tragic insight usually comes at the point of death. Uh, some of you know that many years ago I was honored by hospice uh, for the work that I've done with them. And for years I, I sat with dying people. And I can tell you for sure that the, one of the saddest things in the world is when they have no one to sit with them. Where are my children? I was asked. And time and time again, do you love me, Leo? It's something to think about. And divorces are on the rise. 
80% of those who divorce remarry, and that's nice. But things don't get better the second time around. Don't believe the song. Half of those who remarry will divorce again. Half. Which proves that we need each other, but that we don't change. You only bring who you are into the next relationship, and the next, and the next, and the next. And it's not until you say, no more of this nonsense. I'm going to become more that something actually happens. And you know that the number of third marriages is on the rise. 56% to 3.6 million in the last couple of years have married three times. So in spite of the pain, they keep trying. So there's always hope because we learn to love and we're given so many chances. Love is so patient. So love is going to require that we constantly change and we constantly grow. We're never stuck with who we are or stuck with the situation we're in. As long as we dedicate ourselves to becoming more, we're free to do it. But nothing happens until we dedicate ourselves to this. You know, I'm sure that there are out there, there are so many people with hearts of gold. But a hard-boiled egg has a heart of gold. And unless you do something, it's not going to make any difference that you have a heart of gold. And what you do is important, but what you don't do is also important. How many times I've heard people say, well, I am what I am. Well, congratulations. <laughs> Take me or leave me. Have you heard that one? Take me the way I am or leave me. And then other people are no good. I'm the good one. It's the other people that have the problems. Well, you know, you have the power to be your own Pygmalion. Make yourself over. Don't let other people do it for you. Learn how to trust your own inner voices. You know, I'm convinced that all of us know what we need. All of us know what's important for us. We don't have to have other people tell us. But you know, our voices are loud at the beginning, and then they get softer and softer because we don't listen. If you only listen to what your voices were telling you, you would become the great force behind all of your decisions and your life. You know, I once heard, and I loved it, it said, God only speaks in whispers. You've got to listen. And don't be limited by your experiences of the past. Remember that you have learned to be who you are. Isn't that amazing? You know, we never really think about that. But you are a product of all of your, your experiences from birth onward. That's why we're so wonderfully different. If you want to be the perfect friend, the perfect lover, the ingredients are in you. You know, God gives us the ingredients for bread but he expects us to mix it and to bake it. Not to sit back and wait for it to happen. But you know, research shows that most of us are stuck with who we are unless we are consciously dedicated to change. We actually think we're growing and changing, but actually what we're doing is merely rearranging priorities, prejudices, and postures. Some people haven't really changed for years. How many people who have been diagnosed all at once recognize the wonder of life? And they say, you know, it's amazing, but life is finite. It will come to an end. We don't have forever. You know, that's a brilliant realization. 
We should know that. We should firmly believe it because your life changes the day you recognize you do not have forever. And you don't. So the time to live and to celebrate and to do the things you want to do is now because tomorrow may not be here. Think of how many people that had worked for 20 years in a job and all at once they were laid off. You never thought that would happen. But amazing things have happened. Stories that have been startling about people who were laid off and families that have come together and said, we'll help you. And it's brought people again into a loving unit. Yes, things will happen to us and a lot of negative things will happen to us. But it's not what happens to us, it's how we respond to what's happening to us. That's what makes the difference. Learn from adversity and then it isn't adversity. It's windows of opportunity. And don't pull the curtains. Keep the windows up. And then, you know, if we're going to be a, a lover, and I, I can vouch for this, you've got to maintain a sense of humor. Because we're living in a society of gloom and doom. And you're considered a jerk, literally, if you think life is good. They're, everyone's convinced that Leo doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> He's living in a bubble. How can he be so happy? He goes out in the morning and he says hi to everybody, and he can't wait for the day to happen, and she, he loves everyone. Well, he's a nut. <laughs> you know, I actually have, I, I mean, I'm one who sincerely means it when I say, have a good day, make it a wonderful day. I've got people that say, shut up, I hate it when people say that to me. <laughs> you have a good day. I say, okay. <laughs> really, I've never seen so many people that walk around looking like they've been marinated in vinegar. <laughs> they have a, a floor-level view of life and they want to drag you down to where they are. Well, they're not going to do it. They can come up to where I am, but I'm not going down to where they are. And I love being positive in a negative situation. You know, I'm at the airport and the announcement is made, your flight has been canceled. Ah! Everybody goes mad, they start running to other, you know, and I say, oh, look, if we stick together, we can have a party. <laughs> they run for the gate. <laughs> Crazy man. <laughs> but you know, if you don't get there tomorrow, you'll get there the next day. You know, we're finding that laughter is one of the best therapies possible. It stirs up the blood, it exercises the muscles, it expands the lungs, it stimulates our nerves, it clears our brain, and it creates music for the soul. Blessed are those who can laugh at life, for they'll never run out of things to laugh at. William Fry, who was a professor emeritus at Stanford University Medical School, says, Laughing 100 times a day provides cardiovascular workouts equivalent to 10 minutes of strenuous rowing. <laughs> Laughter boosts cardiovascular fitness by lowering the blood pressure and the heart rate. And you can even get this kind of an effect by feigning laughter. That means you can walk down the street saying, ho, 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 ho! <laughs> and let the others jog.
You know, uh, I had this crazy mama, and, and she loved to laugh. I think that was her, her greatest joy was, was her ability to laugh. And she laughed at everything. People said that, uh, and I know they did this because we used to hear it, that my mother's behavior was inappropriate. But they died at 60, and she died at 82. <laughs> and she'd say to us, you know, when we were sulking around, she'd say, for every moment you allow yourself to be sad, you miss 60 seconds of happiness. So stop it. <laughs> and you know, when I look back at Mama's life, she really had very little of, in our standards to be happy about. She left Italy very poor. And she was that way for most of her life. She worked hard and she raised a, a house full of bambini. And we were really rowdy. She worked hard, as I say. She, she took in washing. But somehow or other, there was always a joy in her life. And you always knew that if you came there, you'd get a smile and a hug. She always had that. And she helped others to laugh, too, because it's contagious. You know, you cannot be around someone who's dying of laughter and be serious. <laughs> Do you know, I was very lucky because in our great big family, it was a real honest-to-goodness extended family. We had elderly in the home all the time. We had people with babies in the home all of the time. We saw births. We went to baptisms, to weddings. We went to hospitals to visit when people were sick, and we were brought to, to funerals to say goodbye. You know, you don't have to teach children about life if you don't protect them from it. Let them see what life is all about. You know, my mother and father never protected us, quote, end quote, from an argument. And you know what we learned? That you can love each other and still scream at each other. And that's been invaluable. We need to tell our children the stories about our background. And if they won't listen to what mommy used to do, and pull down! Nothing's more important. Listen! You know, I used to hear about my great-grandfather. I used to hear about my great-grandmother. I used to hear what they did in Italy. I could visualize the village in which my mother was born. Getting in touch with that aspect of yourself. Most of us are standing on isolated islands and we don't even know who we are. Where do you come from? You want to know? Ask. They're still living, I'll bet. Mama, tell me about where you came from. Tell me about your happiest moment. Tell me about your saddest moment. Tell me who was the first person to kiss you. That's the wonder. That's the magic. In our society, we hide our age because we fear being unloved and lonely. And what a pity when it's the time for celebration. We have all kinds of misconceptions about age. We, th we say 65 is old. Huh. Ask me. <laughs> we say that older means a loss of intelligence or a loss of productivity or a loss of attractiveness or a loss of zest for life that we become more dependent, that we become sexless, huh? <laughs> and that all older people are the same. 
You know, gerontological research has shown us that as long as we continue to accept the challenge of ourselves, our sharpness, our understanding, our verb for life grows rather than diminishes. You know, sure, I'm not the same person you saw 15 years ago on television. Let's face it, I'm different in a lot of ways. For one, I'm losing my memory. You know, I, I, I'm always walking into the rooms and I don't know what I went there for. <laughs> oh, it's important, I must go to the bathroom for a minute. I walk in there and I think, why did I come in here? <laughs> you know, but I long since gave up caring. I'm not going to worry about what I've lost. I still have a little bit left. I found out that old age is really the prime of life. The only problem is it takes a little longer to prime it. <laughs> and you know, in youth, all of my youth, I sought the pot of gold. And now in old age, I'm pleased just to find the pot. <laughs> and it takes me even longer to get over a good time than it took to have it. <laughs> you know, recently, You know, I want to tell you this because it's an outrage. I recently went to the doctor and I told him about a certain thing, you know, that I was worried about. And he actually looked me in the face and said, well, what do you expect? You want to live forever? <laughs> <laughs> no, I said, I don't want to live forever. But while I'm alive, I'd like to live in the best manner possible. I, I was reminded of a wonderful story of a man who went to see the doctor because his right arm ached. And the doctor said, rather sarcastically, well, after all, Mr. Jones, your right arm is 80 years old. And he said, well, so is my left arm, and it doesn't ache. <laughs> you know, happiness isn't dependent upon age. It isn't correlated with age. You can celebrate many, many things, because age gives person license. It's wonderful. You can, it finally gives you license to be totally who you are. You can finally speak your mind. You know, you can dye your hair blue. <laughs> your kids say, Mom, have you gone crazy? No, I'm just getting my senses. <laughs> but blue hair, well, if you don't like it, don't come and see me. <laughs> you can dress in wild outfits. You can wear almost anything you want. You can order six desserts. <laughs> Look at the menu. I can't judge. Bring them all. <laughs> and you finally learn that happiness is not dependent upon a single person or a single event. You know how you worry about what will so-and-so think? Well, you know, I guarantee you, so-and-so doesn't think, so don't worry about it. And the world doesn't end, you learn, because somebody rejects you. If somebody, A, rejects you, you go to B. Maybe B is better than A. But here, we, you know, when you're young, you die because somebody says, I don't like you. Well, you know, when you're older, you can say, well, tough for you, I'm neat. <laughs> and you don't have to live for others. And then another thing, it's possible for you to say no without a million excuses. You know, I don't want to is a really good excuse. <laughs> but we say, oh, I can't because the cat is sick and the, the window is broken and I, I, oh, I'd love to come, but, you know, and you're thinking, oh, why doesn't she leave me alone? <laughs> you know, it's wonderful to be able to say, Sally, I just don't want to, so knock it off. And you know, we're, we're scared to death because we're told that everything we eat, for instance, our health, because the, everything we eat is going to give us cancer. If it doesn't give us cancer, it's going to give us heart problems. If it doesn't give us heart problems, it's going to have osteoporosis. And so we're sitting there saying, should I, should I, shut up? You know, think about it. Everything we were told 10 years ago that were horrible for us are now the big things for health. <laughs> I remember just 10 years ago, pasta. You better not eat pasta. People who eat pasta die. <laughs> now it's all oh, have pasta at least seven times a day. <laughs> olive oil. Remember when olive oil was next to poison? 
Now they have it at the table and you pour it on your bread and you pour it on your aunt and your uncle. And, <laughs> and then remember how terrible it was, red wine. Now they say it takes care of your heart. A glass of red, you know. So just don't be neurotic about it, enjoy. I, my my uh, youngest sister recently died and uh, I went to see her. She used to love, she had a certain kind of chocolate that she just loved. And I said, I really want to get, I went everywhere searching for these chocolates and I brought them. I said, uh, Lee, this is for you. And her nurse said, do you want to kill your sister? <laughs> Here she is, you know, with tubes and can't we make her happy for this last, if she wants to eat seven pounds of chocolates, eat them. She was, she was so beautiful. You know, there's that marvelous thing that like 10 years after she's dead, she's going to look better than her nurse. But uh, Samuel Ullman, who's written some beautiful things, says this, nobody grows old merely living a number of years. People grow old by deserting their ideals. Years may wrinkle the skin, but to give up wrinkles the soul. Worry, doubt, distrust, fear, and despair, these are the long, long years that bow the head and turn the spirit to dust. So the villains our worry and doubt and distrust and fear and despair. Let's look at them. Why worry? You know, doing beats stewing. Wisdom. Instead of worrying about things, do something! And if there's nothing really that you can do, then forget it. Nine times out of ten, they take care of themselves, don't they? They really do. Why open the umbrella before it starts raining? There's nothing, there's no worry in the world worth worrying about. And what about doubt? Doubt is an invitation to think. And don't ask for any other benefit of the doubt because there isn't any. And you know, distrust. The person who's all wrapped up in himself is overdressed. When you create a mountain out of a molehill, don't wonder why people won't climb it with you. And fear, you know, don't be afraid to climb out on a limb. That's where the fruit is. Fear is running from something that most often isn't even chasing you. And Elman continues, in the central place in your heart there is a wireless station. So long as it receives messages of beauty, hope, cheer, courage, grandeur, and power from the earth, from men and from the infinite, so long will you be young. When the wires are all down and all the central place in your heart is covered with the snows of pessimism and the ice of cynicism, then you are old indeed and may God have mercy on your soul. So, you know, it's a choice. And then love is going to require that we make sacrifices. And, you know, we don't like to make sacrifices. We like to think that the world is made for us alone. You know, I worked with kids for years, and I was amazed at their attitude that the world is theirs, and if they don't get what they want, they're going to raise the dickens. I used to ask in my love class, what these kids, what have you sacrificed lately? to make the world a better place. They didn't even know what I was talking about. What do you mean sacrificed? Oh, they gave up things in order to get things, but that's not sacrifice. Because sacrifice is getting up, giving up something 
with expectations of nothing, just wanting to make things better. Do you know that there are cultures where the elderly actually stay behind and die so that the younger people can have the food to live? That's sacrifice. But you know, it seems to me that so many people never outgrow the stage of self-absorption. What's in it for me? They cry out and they moan. They think again that the world owes them a living. Children are praised before they really merit it. And you know, that's why tests show that most children think they, they're better than they are. You know, I love concepts about self-concept and self-esteem, but you know, in order to feel self-esteem, you've got to do something to feel esteem about. Just because you are isn't enough. Do something great, and then you'll be proud of yourself. Step out of yourself and say, what is there to do? I have so much to do. You know, George Bernard Shaw, who always put the, the hammer right on the head of the nail, said this, this is the true joy of life, being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, by being thoroughly worn out before you're thrown on the scrap heap, by being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish little clod of ailments complaining that the world would not devote itself to making you happy. And Norman Cousins says, the clock provides only a technical measurement of how we live. Far more than the ticking of time is the way we open the minutes and invest them with meaning. Death is not the ultimate tragedy of life. The ultimate tragedy of life is to die without having discovered life's possibilities. As I started tonight with the statement, love is the greatest gift of life and our most profound experience, I guarantee that if you miss love, you miss the purpose of life. And it's certainly true that we were all born for love. But there is so much that each of us needs to do before we realize it. Dedicating yourself to being a lover in the thousands of ways in which you can personify it in reality. The world needs our love now probably more than it has ever needed it. So please, either lead or follow or get the hell out of the way. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>